How did Moses change in the Bible? That's what we're going to talk about today. Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he has worked for you today. And for the Egyptians, for whom you shall never see again, the Lord will fight for you, and you have to be only silent. Exodus 14, 13. Today we're going to talk about Moses and the changes that he went through in his stories in the Bible. The story of the Israelites in Egypt was a long story. We remember that Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers and became the second-hand man to the Egyptian pharaoh. He made sure that Egypt was strengthened during a time of famine so that it could protect its own people. It also protected the many other people living in this land of Goshen, which is this in-between area. And he allowed them to come graze their animal and survive this terrible famine. Because Joseph did that and also welcomed his own family, and because the Pharaoh showed this kindness, Joseph brought his family into the land of Egypt because so many other people followed People were living there for a long time. I think the general idea of most people is that many people came to Egypt on their own. It was a common place for people to flee to when they wanted to get outside the government or famine or some bad situation was happening there. But the people lived and stayed for such a long time. And you could see how this would slowly progress from, hey, come into our land, work, But, you know, you're welcome to be here to one day you wake up and you're now slaves in a different pharaoh's holdings. You're building things for this other pharaoh. One article I even read suggested that they were being nickeled and dimed to death, put into debt every time they needed seed, any time they needed anything from the Egyptian government. They eventually became so far indebted, they just went from being servants to pay off their debts directly into slavery. Times change. And so what we do is we find that there are many people inside this land of Goshen and inside of Egypt itself that couldn't leave now. They weren't allowed to leave and were under the thumb of Pharaoh. And so then there were people that were placed over the Hebrew people that were meant to keep them in line, make them do hard work. There was storage cities, they called in this book, too. I I watched a few documentaries. One was called Pithom, and the other was Ramses. The interesting part about it, we talked a little bit when we talked about the Red Sea book, is that a lot of people, historians, even when I was in college, oh, there weren't many Israelites inside of Egypt. This was all baloney. There were no slaves. And there was no great leaving of slaves. And then they found that in... One of the steelies, the Jewish people were mentioned. They were in a particular town, and eventually they found the remains of Israeli style homes built in, I don't want to call it a, like a neighborhood that where they lived together. And it even said that one time they then disappeared into the sea. So there is record of something happening. Now the whole thing comes in dates. We're not going to talk about dates, we're talking about Moses and what he went through. And it said that the people groaned under this slavery, and God heard their cry. I mean, how many years was that? It was about 400 years. And they finally cried out to God, and God started to act to bring them out. In fact, in Genesis 15, 13, it says, Know for certain that your descendants will be stranger in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they serve, and afterwards they will come out, Exodus, with many possessions. It was a prophecy that was made. But now we're looking at this, starting out in Exodus 1.12, they were oppressed, they were dreaded by the Egyptian people. I think one of the things that you'll notice in People comment about it is how much the Jewish people stuck together and stuck to their ways and remembered the traditions of God through almost every situation. So when the Pharaoh sees they're getting to be many of them, 
people worried about it inside of Egypt. Pharaoh decided he's going to do something about it. So there were two Hebrew midwives, one called Shipra and the other Pua. I don't know the names of many people who were slaves at this time. And they were the ones who decided that they were going to save the Hebrew babies when the Pharaoh decided to kill every son of the Hebrew people. This was the instruction going out to the midwives. So they were told, kill your own people. They were the ones responsible for giving birth. So it said that the midwives feared God. They still remembered after all these years what God's promises to them were. And they decided to let boys live. So he called the midwives you know, to him and said, hey, why'd you do this? Why'd you let the boys live? I told you not to. And the Hebrew women made up a baloney line that said, because Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They give birth so fast. We just can't get there in time. They made a lie to try to save the babies and save their own skin for saving the babies. And the book points out that God rewarded these two for saving babies, not because they lied. Their deceit was still a sin, but they protected the babies, did what was right in the eyes of God. And the book talks about no matter how much pressure is put on you to do the wrong thing, it is still the pressure that God puts on us to do the right thing that becomes the most important thing. So then Moses comes into this particular chapter. The overview of it is that he spent his first 40 years in Egypt. So he was hidden away. He lived with his parents for three months. We know now he had an older sister named Miriam, which means Mary, and a brother that was younger than Miriam, about three years old, named Aaron. But he was still in danger. They took him to the waterside and put him in a basket, placed him in the reeds, and the basket floated. His sister, Miriam, stood at a distance so that he knew what would happen. Daughter of Pharaoh comes down, finds him. We know all this story we probably heard in Sunday school. Finds him and takes him in as her own. She knew that this was one of the Hebrew children. And then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, oh, should I go find a nursemaid? You know, we, we have a lot of nursemaids around. And goes and gets Moses' mother to feed the baby and nurse the baby. Pharaoh's daughter let that happen. She said that, go ahead and take this child away. Nurse him for me. I'll give you wages. And so then the child grew up in Pharaoh's household. Pharaoh's daughter calls him Moses because it means I drew him out of the water. Moses would have had this entire education of the best of everything. He would have learned math and science and art and literature. He would have learned leadership probably fighting in armies and leading armies. He would have known it all. Someone even said his destiny was probably marrying someone like Cleopatra, uh, an aristocrat who has high standing. Meanwhile, the Hebrews were living in these tiny shacks. They were living in these small built homes and being slaves to the Egyptian people, working in the heavy sun you know, it's a, it's a great picture of two types of people at that time, the highborn, the highly prized, and the lowly slaves. It doesn't say anything about whether or not he sought out God, whether he knew his ways. You know, we just can guess at the fact that what kind of education he would have had. We first get signs of Moses having a temper. He sees one of the Hebrew people being beaten by an Egyptian. And it said one of his own people. So he must have known, Pharaoh's daughter must have told him that he was among the Hebrew people. So when he sees this Egyptian beating this man, he goes out, he looks around, he doesn't see anyone, and he strikes down the Egyptian and hit him, it says, in the sand. He killed him, he struck him down. Goes out the next day and the two Hebrews talk to Moses. Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me just like you killed that guy? Moses was afraid. I mean, they had laws in Egypt. And so he takes off and runs to Midian. The exact location of Midian is under debate. We're not entirely sure. But people generally believe it's somewhere in the Arabian desert, maybe even towards the land of Jordan. So he runs off. 
And it says he sat down by a well. Can you imagine just running and running and running because you're afraid? Basically just sat down as soon as he finds the very first thing he has, which is a well. It said the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill up their troughs of their father's flock. So he came by there. And when he came to their father's home, he was introduced to the father. And it says, hey, Egypt delivered to us one of their shepherds while we were drawing water for the flocks. So they came in, they gave him a good meal, and Moses now lived with this family. And this father gave one of his daughters, Zipporah, to Moses as his wife, and she gave birth to a son called Gershom. So that ends this very erudite, very high-level life of being an Egyptian prince to now being wanted probably for murder. So the king of Egypt died, says then the people groaned because their slavery was so hard and they cried for God to rescue them. And my thought is it must have gotten much worse under this next king than the old king because they didn't groan before, but boy, they're groaning now. So Moses is there tending his father-in-law's flock, whose name is Jethro, the priest of Midian. He comes to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, says, in a flame in the midst of a bush. Moses had to turn away because it was such a great sight. It was probably very bright. And the Lord saw that he turned aside and called him from out of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am. We've been talking about this in the New Testament, but when God calls himself, I am, is Yahweh. The thing that Jewish people won't say because it's so holy is the name of God. I am. And Jesus calls himself that, but now Moses is hearing God call it. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And he hid his face because he was afraid. And we have to think about Moses being picked. He was a murderer. God did not tell Moses to strike down this murderer. We find out Moses has a rage problem. He saw that Egyptian treating that other man poorly, and his rage probably came out, and he struck him down. It's interesting. Couldn't have been too ragey because he did look around first to see if anyone was checking it out. But we see that Moses rebuilt his life. Now he has a family, a father-in-law. He has a job and an occupation. He's married the daughter and has children. He has rebuilt his life from being a prince of Egypt, from being sitting at that well by himself wondering what's going to become of him, to now having a place and a position of his own. But we have to remember that God uses us where we're at. Moses, who murdered a man in cold blood, even though the man was treating someone else very poorly, someone at his last leg, he was saved and now has a family in place. This book says that you have to know that when God calls you, it can be moments of failure. It can be moments of success. It can be many different things. But Charles Swindoll says, quote, if you're waiting for a seamless blemish-free week, friend, you're going to wait in vain. There's no such thing. Until we learn how to derive lessons from seasons of failure and loss, we'll keep repeating those failures, digging ourselves deeper into a hole rather than moving up as we grow. Moses did move on and learn to have this entirely new life. Must have been weird Then the book was talking about that how you're sitting there now tending sheep when at one point you were an Egyptian prince getting the best of everything. God tells Moses then, seeing the affliction of my people, I know what's happening. I know they're suffering. I know that they're in pain and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of Egypt, which should be your first warning sign. He's coming to you to be the instrument of his redemption. I want to bring them, it says, into the land of milk and honey. And so I'm going to send you to the Pharaoh to bring my children out. And Moses is like, no, no, no. First of all, question, who am I? I can't do that. I'm just like this shepherd guy. I can't do that, that I should go to this Pharaoh. Which makes you wonder, too, that if the king of Egypt died over the many days, this was probably Pharaoh's son, since it went down in lineage to the children. Maybe this is the guy that Moses studied with, went to school with, sparred with on the fake battlegrounds to teach him how to be warriors. This is someone he probably knew how many people, only one, 
who's going to become the next king of Egypt. So he probably knew that guy. This is now Moses at a much older age. That prince is going to be at a much older age too. God comforts him. I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you to bring my people out. And Moses is not buying this. If I go to the people of Israel and say, your God told me to get you out of here. And they say, well, what's his name? What do I even tell them? And this is what God says, I am who I am, Yahweh. Tell my people that. I am sent me to you. You imagine God handing out a business card with the words, I am on it. And gave this message for Moses to tell people, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Gather the elders of Israel together. He gives Moses the plan, the message to tell them. And then once you've gathered the elders of Israel to them, they'll listen to you. They'll listen to your voice. The Lord, the God of Hebrews, has met with us and is pleased to let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord God. And Moses is like, you know, I know the king of Egypt and he's not going to let you go unless he's forced to do it. Okay, so then I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with the wonders that I will do. And then he's going to let you go. And not only that, and you're going to have any woman who lives in the house ask for silver, gold, clothing, put them on your sons and your daughters. You shall plunder the Egyptians. Okay. And you just imagine Moses listening to this and going, you know, they're not going to believe me. This is, they're not, none of this is going to happen because they're not going to believe me at all. They're going to think I'm lying. They're just not going to go for this whole thing. So he asks Moses, what's in his hand? It's a staff. And he's thrown the ground and he becomes a serpent. Whoa. And then catch it again. And it catches it again. It becomes a staff again. Show them that. That will be a sign to them that God is with you. Put your hand in your cloak. And when you take it out, ooh, it's leprous. Now he's unclean. Put it back in your cloak and it's healed. They're going to see these signs and wonders and they will understand that you have me on your side. That I'm going to pull the people of Egypt out. So Moses gives it one last stab and is like, you know, I'm not much of a talker. I'm not eloquent. And I'm slow of tongue, you know, maybe he stuttered, maybe he had a speech impediment. And God says, you know what? Who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute and deaf and blind? I'm the one. I'm the one who does it. Now go and I will be in your mouth and you'll know what to speak. I'll, I'll tell you the things you're saying. We hear that in the Old Testament too, where God tells people that we're going to send you out. Don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit is going to put the right words in your mouth and people will listen. That's what he's telling them here. And then Moses gives it one last try. Oh, send somebody else. <laughs> I could see that. I could see positions I would be in where God asked me to do something. And you hope you're going to be that person who does it. But he'd be like, you just send someone else. I don't feel qualified to do what it is you're telling me to do. It says, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Isn't your brother a Levite? I know he can speak. He's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he's going to be happy. He'll be your spokesman. He'll be able to put words in your mouth. If you're so nervous about this, I'll have Aaron help you. Now take your staff and go. Woo. All right. So Moses tried to get out of it. He really tried his best to do it. So you have to get this day down that we now have an 80-year-old shepherd who used to be a famous prince, got the best education, now is walking around the desert sees the bush that is on fire. The bush wasn't God, <laughs> clearly, but God put it on fire so that it would get his attention, and it did. And now God is saying, you're going to go in, you're going to talk to the elders, you're going to tell them you're going to take them out of Egypt. God heard your calls of pain. You're going to go to Moses, you're going to have these signs, and you're going to pull people out and bring them back into the desert. Really? An 80-year-old man who's listening to this message? Ooh. I think most of us think that when we get to 80 years old, even if we were to live to 120, we would think our days of adventure are past us. We know what we're going to do. We're going to go tend those sheep. But instead, God calls Moses out of his life of comfort and says, you're going to be the rescuer of the people of Israel. You're going back to the city and you're going to go ahead and do this. 
I don't think Moses believed it. But when you're talking to God, what are you going to do? God is talking to you, giving you his name, telling you his message. He's not taking no for an answer. No matter how much you try to convince him, this is what you're going to do next. At this point in the book, it talks about that we run when we're sent. We retreat when we fail and we resist when we are called. But eventually, those of us obedient to God will listen and follow in what God told you to do. The book even mentions, have you ever tried to talk God out of something, out of his plan, out of what he's trying to do? Doesn't work very well. And we're good for it because part of his plan was to save us. You weren't going to talk God out of sending Jesus to redeem us. We're not going to talk God out of redeeming his people out of Egypt. Or Jonah is like, I'm not going to Nineveh. No way. Or Gideon, who had his mighty force. You don't talk God out of things. You listen to God, and then you do what God tells you to do. I mean, in the end, he's God. What are you going to do? Tell God what to do? So then he goes back home and tells his father-in-law, I have to go and get my brothers out of Egypt, see whether or not they're still alive. Jethro, being a good man, is still in peace. So there we are. We're going to go back. Moses takes his wife and his son, puts them on a donkey, and back they go to Egypt. And as he's going back with the staff that God told him to take, God said to Moses, when you go back and you see the Pharaoh and all the miracles that I've put in your power, I will harden his heart and he's not going to let your people go. And this is what you're going to tell him. And so we're going to talk about next podcast what it is he ends up telling the Pharaoh. An interesting message that Father Mike Schmitz in his daily Bible podcast says, when it says that God hardened his heart, we don't know that it means that God intentionally caused Pharaoh to say no. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people think it is. That it's more like what Mike Schmidt said, the sun. If you are wax, the sun melts you. It, it makes you a puddle. If you are clay, the hot sun hardens you, turns you into brick. It is not God doing these things. It is your reaction to the sun. That's kind of the idea. When all this starts happening, it's going to harden Pharaoh's heart because that is what he intends to do with it. Woo. So the Lord goes to Aaron and says, go meet your brother in the wilderness. They met each other. They kissed. And Moses told Aaron the whole story, the signs, everything he's supposed to do. Aaron started practicing the words and doing the signs and doing all the things he was supposed to say. So we're going to go ahead and end the podcast here. Next week, we're going to talk about what happens when Moses gets back to Egypt and that mission. I said we're breaking it up into the three parts of Moses' life. The one part is 80 years. The middle part is some years. And then the last part is also some of the years. But it's not broken into three parts when it comes to the years. Most of the exciting things that happen to Moses happen in the last 40 years. So my challenge to you is think about what is it that God would come to you and tell you to do that you would be like, I'm not doing that. I'm not qualified to do that. Or maybe you don't want to do that. Think about the kinds of reaction you might have if you saw God in a burning bush and he started talking to you. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm happy to hear about your Christian life, what you're going through, if there's any topics you would like to hear about. And remember, our walk, our long walk back to Egypt starts with small steps. 